really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about my book and to have a conversation with Greg about, about the book and, and the making of the book and then to have a discussion with all of you about it. It's a really exciting time to be writing about tech and uh, it turns out, um, and uh, who knew that it was that my timing would have been so uh, so good. So, um, so I I wrote this book. I've been studying the history of the Valley for God, since the dot com era. Um, when I was a graduate student writing my dissertation, which became my first book, and moved out here to the Bay Area, and uh, all of a sudden was like, how does how this is how can I understand this? Uh, strange and amazing place that I, I'm not a technologist, I'm a historian, I worked in politics, uh, and how can I understand its history? And this was the book that I kind of wished existed back then, uh, a book that was, that explained, that took the story of the valley and placed it within the broader currents of American history, political history, the history of presidents and congresses and Democrats and Republicans, um, business history more broadly, and social history and cultural history and popular culture and 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 showing why the, kind of this amazing story about how this place that not not just San Francisco but this place 40 miles south of San Francisco that was a bunch of orchards becomes the command and control center for this global technology network um, and now has uh, seated three of the five biggest technology companies the other two in my hometown of Seattle that um, whose software and products are almost inescapable. Even if you decide you want to unplug, it's very hard to, as you guys know well, to people who even think they're not using Amazon are using <laughs> Amazon in some way. Um, and so I wanted to, to answer that question that's been asked to me so many times in the last 20 years, which is, well, okay, so how did Silicon Valley do it? And what's the magic? What's the magic formula? How'd you do it? And then oftentimes when I'm talking to audiences outside of California or outside the United States, they're like, okay, how do we build one of our own? And so this book answers those questions. But I also wanted to, you know, you, whenever you're writing a book, you want to disrupt narratives, right? We're all in the business of disruption of some kind. Um, and I wanted to kind of tell a story, pull together the familiar stories and also contextualize them in a bigger story. And so a familiar story, if you're sort of asking the question of who made Silicon Valley, um, you would say, you know, these guys, you go, if you're thinking, you know, go back to the garage, go back to um, the 70s and, and the Steves making the Apple One and the motherboard and that's, you know, that's history. And if for the people who are really, you know, old time or people who are like, well, let me tell you, this history doesn't start there. It goes all the way back to Fairchild Semiconductor and the Traders 8, right? And the guys who quit Bill Shockley's semi Silicon Semiconductor startup and start get venture backing courtesy of a junior banker named Arthur Rock uh, and start their own company, kind of the, the original venture backed startup, so to speak. And so I wanted to tell those stories, but then put them into a bigger tapestry of many human stories. Because to answer the question of how the Valley came to be and why it's been so remarkable at generating generation after generation of, of remarkable companies, you need to enlarge the canvas and bring new people in. You need to go further back in time. You need to go back to an even older generation whose stories begin before Fairchild Semiconductor, but span all the way through to the present day. People like David Morgenthaler, who is a MIT engineer turned corporate executive turned venture capitalist, who is probably, Morgenthaler Ventures is probably a familiar um, name to many of you in the room. Uh, someone like Anne Hardy, who was like many women of her generation, she wanted to be she was really interested in science and math and she was the mid 50s and she was not given opportunities in school to enter the same sorts of programs that the men that uh, her, 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 her generation were allowed to enter and she learns programming on the job and she goes on to design the operating system for a pioneering time sharing network timeshare which is based in palo alto in the 1960s the internet before the internet so to speak, um, getting computers to talk to one another, later becomes a startup entrepreneur herself. Uh, and other, other people 
venture capitalists, um, our VCs are a very big part of this story, um, the connective tissue from generation to generation. But as you guys know, many VCs were once operators, people like Burt McMurtry, um, uh, the late great, re recently passed away last year, um, uh, someone who I, all of these were people that I got to know as I was researching this book and who were extraordinary sources for me and inspirations for me in shaping the story and honoring their amazing careers with this story. Uh, and showing how this, this bigger tapestry, these people that you may, the people outside the valley may never have heard of, how they're also part of it. And also lawyers and marketers and the, all the different specialized uh, service firms that make up the ecosystem of the valley, how, how and why that makes this, this place distinctive. And so where the story begins, I was saying earlier that when I embarked upon this book, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to start in the 70s with Intel. Um, that's where I'm going to start, kind of the, the beginning of the, the, you know, when the chip making industry really starts um, taking off and when you be beginning of video games and Xerox Park. And then I realized that to really fully tell the story, you have to go back even further. Look, I'm a historian. I like, <laughs> I like going back and the, taking the long view. Um, and how, and, and you know, part of the reason that Silicon Valley became what it was, was because of what wasn't there or what was there before. This was an agricultural valley like meant so many others in California. Uh, it was pretty unremarkable with a couple of exceptional characteristics. But one thing it had was just acres and acres and acres of or orchards. There wasn't anything there to displace. There wasn't an incumbent industry that was setting the tone for the business culture. In fact, there wasn't industry at all. When David Morgenthaler, the young GI I just showed you in the previous slide, gets off, visits Palo Alto in the late 40s, he's, he's uh, this young up and coming corporate executive. He's like, wow, this is great. I want to stay here. And someone he's talking to saying, there's no work for you here. You can be, you either already have to have money or you need to be a farmer. There's really nothing else going on. If you're a corporate executive, you, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no place for you there. And of course it changes very rapidly. And the thing that, that goes, goes where you go from the prunes and the apricots into electronics being the growth industry of the valley is the turning point of World War II. The Cold War, the military spending that during, the Cold, that during World War II and afterwards flows in unprecedented amounts, not just across the United States, but particularly to the West Coast and to California, has this transformative effect on the Pacific West and on the Santa Clara Valley. But even though you have military activity all the way up and down, the thing that sets the valley apart, and that this again is really important when we think about what's, what's, what's different about here. Why, why, not, why not LA? Why not other, other parts of the West Coast? Why not Seattle initially? Seattle and LA are building big. They're building airplanes. Here are airplanes at Moffett Field, which is down, down Mountain View. But Seattle and, and, and there, were, you know, there, was, there, was, there were military installations here. But what was being built in the valley from the very beginning? Small electronics and instrumentation, communications devices, microwave, radar, ways, elect, means of electronic communication, and technologies that are rapidly downsizing technologies to make them smaller and more powerful. And here's where another really important character and, dis and the thing that distinguishes this land of prune sheds and apricot orchards from other agricultural valleys in California, it's the presence of Stanford University. And particularly the presence of the guy whose back is here to the camera, shaking the hand of two of his former graduate students, David Packard and Bill Hewlett. The guy who's shaking hands is Fred Terman, the Dean of Engineering and Provost of Stanford who sees early on that the US government is going to get in the research and development business in a big way. And this is the way that Stanford is going to become a world-class institution. He was very instrumental about it. Look, Stanford, and I'm sure there are many Stanford grads in the, in the audience. I also know that there are many Cal grads here. The Cal grads will be happy when I remark on the fact that in the 40s, Stanford was fine. Cal was better. Stanford was not the Harvard of the West. It had aspirations, and Terman saw federal funding as the way to make that happen. 
And so Stanford completely remakes its curriculum in the 50s. It builds, up science, it builds up physics and the sciences generally. It builds up engineering. It starts building up entire graduate programs that are focused on things like microwaves and silicon semiconductor technology so that the needs of industry are being met. No other university in the world is doing this. Subsequently, other universities have sort of been similarly entrepreneurial. But this was kind of a remaking of Stanford to really become a true Cold War university that sets it apart and continues to set it apart. Stanford is unusual in the amount of porosity there is between industry and academia and the ability that faculty members have to flow back and forth and the way that students there, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, are kind of set up to have connections to industry. And this started in the 50s. And this was Stanford's path to greatness. And the thing that really, the, best, the most important product that comes out of Stanford wasn't tech. I mean, yes, there's been really important technology transfer. That's an important part of the story, mostly on the biotech side. And I will say that this book really focuses on the IT side, on the, on the software, computer hardware and software side. Um, because biotech, as you guys who, who are in it and invest in it know, is a very different, different business model, different time scale. But the most important tech product, technology product, that comes out of Stanford is people, right? It's Hewlett and it's Packard being, being personally persuaded by Fred Terman to stick around Palo Alto and start their company there. It's someone like Bill Shockley, co-inventor of the transistor, originally from Palo Alto, who Terman personally persuades to come back and start his company there. Shockley was also, you know, kind of wanted to come home, but he was thinking about going to LA. And so Stanford's presence was really why he came there. And with him, he hires these young, bright engineers. No one follows him from Bell Labs. Turns out there was a reason, because he was terrible to work for. So, but with Sh even though Shockley Semiconductor was a short-lived operation, it brought the silicon to, semi to Silicon Valley, and it became the seedbed for an entire chip-making industry to come. So back to building small. So it's not just Cold War spending, and it's not just the government decides to flip, you know, spend a lot of money and so there's tech. The really critical thing is the entrepreneurial way in which this money gets spent. So look, it's the 1950s. What are the politics of the 1950s? It's the McCarthy era. It's the Cold War. Why is the Cold War happening? It's a fight for American democracy against Soviet socialism. What is the last thing that Dwight Eisenhower and the leaders, the congressional leaders are going to do in the 1950s? Build some giant centralized research engine where they keep all the activity in the government. No, they're going to build out the military industrial complex and its research components by, through private industry. They're going to spend through private universities like Stanford. They're going to give money to spend money, um, their money through private defense contractors like Lockheed Missiles in Space, which locates in Sunnyvale in 1954. Lockheed, by the way, was the biggest employer in the Valley through the late 80s. In the middle part of the 80s, there were four times as many people working at Lockheed as there were working at Apple. So it's this big, hidden story that continues through the whole Valley's history, including part of the history where we think, OK, yeah, that back in the day, there was military spending, but then there was this commercial industry. It coexisted, and it continues to coexist. <coughs> Um, and, and that interaction is still there. But you know, by, the, by the 50s, you, so you have electronics growing. But again, the center of the electronics industry is on the East Coast. IBM's on the East Coast. The computer industry is all on the East Coast, Boston, New York. What sets the Valley's small electronic specialty into overdrive is when the space race goes into overdrive. Fairchild Semiconductor, the original venture-backed startup, deservedly hailed as the granddaddy of them all, right? Every kind of all starts at Fairchild and goes there. Here you have Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, Eugene Kleiner, you know, name your Silicon Valley luminary. These people go on to found the foundational firms and companies that make this place and continue to drive this place. And this was not a defense contractor. These guys were not, you know, they, they did not form Fairchild because they were like, we're going to go after this defense money. But that was the main action those days. There wasn't commercial market for silicon semiconductors of any significance. The big market, and particularly when you got to more, more sophisticated transistor technology, 
the sort of stuff like the integrated circuits that Fairchild develops, the noise develops at Fairchild a few years later, there's, there's no enterprise client for that. There's certainly not customer facing. There's, you know, what, what are you gonna do with that? It's, you know, everything's running on strings and mechanics then. Fairchild is founded, incorporated informally in September 1957. Two and a half weeks later, the Soviets shoot the Sputnik satellite into space. And then Washington DC's hair catches on fire. <laughs> And the money that's already being spent on electronics of, by the Defense Department, of which there is a considerable amount, is now added to by this new massive civilian agency, NASA. And also the creation of new, turn, new significant research-focused, advanced research-focused entities, significantly the Advanced Research Projects Agency, later known as DARPA, out of the Pentagon, also founded in the wake of Sputnik. Huge upswing in spending on electronics. And so Fairchild's great stroke of good timing, because <laughs> isn't the story of, startup stories is often about timing, right? So it is coming, is coming into being right at the moment when the market for the stuff that it's creating is exploding. And particularly by the early 1960s, when you have integrated circuits that have been in a much more complex and more powerful and more expensive, dearly expensive technology. Who is the main customer for that? The Apollo program. To, to send to a man to the moon, you need very small, very light, very powerful devices. I had, when I was down at Stanford in the early stages of researching the book, I had a really great lunchtime conversation with the late Bill Miller, who was founder of Stanford's computer science department, later at the business school, later provost, and this legendary guy. And I have to give him full credit for helping me understand how the, particularly the chip making, the semiconductor industry, the ecosystem that grows, how that related to NASA and the space program. Because I think it's a beautiful example of how the story of, the, of American technology is not just, it's not just government spending, and it's also not just free market entrepreneurship. It's the two things working in tandem together which usually we don't think of those things as working in tandem, right? You think of them as adversarial concepts, right? The more government, the less entrepreneurship you have. But what happens with the, with the, with the semiconductor industry is, is so, in the 60s is you have all of this money flowing from NASA, this huge demand. It's not earmarked. It's not, there's no kind of special, you know, some congressman from Illinois is like, no, I want that to go to my district because no one else is making the stuff that the Apollo program needs. So it's all going here, and there's incredible competition for these, among these small firms for a piece of the action. And as that federal business, the NASA business, grows, then the price of everything goes down, and so it enables a commercial market to become possible. Uh, IC is no longer $2,500, it's a tenth of the cost. And then the state of the, and Moore's law, you know, the flywheel starts going. And so you have this incredibly competitive private set of private sector companies that are all jostling for a piece of this now kind of hybrid, partially government business and increasingly more commercial business. The culture of the semiconductor industry, the kind of, the kind of grow fast, move fast, be agile, be the first to market, grow the market, that is all being set in place amid this kind of tsunami of federal spending. And so it's this really interesting symbiotic relationship that often escapes when you look at other geographies and what they've, other nations and what they've tried to do to build silicon whatevers. There's been an immense amount of public spending. A lot of it has been top down, often command and control. A lot of it has been like, we're gonna build a beautiful research park and they will come. That's actually missing the nuances of the American model, which to be clear was very particular to this moment in American history, which I think is part of why the needle is hard to thread. There was kind of the, there was no one in Washington being like, aren't you spending a little too much? Um, there was a lot of, a lot of leeway and a lot of tolerance for risk taking, for blue sky technologies, for just throwing the spaghetti on the wall and see what would stick. So by the time you get to the 70s and you get to, you know, the, the semiconductor industry as we know it, Again, these guys aren't defense contractors. By that point, defense spending has declined. Commercial market has grown. By the 70s, you have, yeah, this, this 
I, pr I have to say, I put up the slide partially just for the ties. <laughs> Bob Noyce's tie, actually, that should be in the Computer History Museum. I want you guys, <laughs> Marguerite, can you get on that? Um, uh, but you know, these are, you know, these sort of iconic companies are, again, like forging this entrepreneurial model, but it is not separate from these broader trends of political history and economic history. And part of the reason that companies like Intel are deservedly so, so highly praised as they're coming into their own is think about what else is happening with the US economy in the 70s and the early 80s. There's no good news, right? This is the one bright spot. This is the phoenix rising out of the ashes of the de de declining manufacturing economy. This is an industry that figured out how to offshore and outsource really early, that figured out how to get a really flexible supply chain, how to upsize, downsize, not having kind of the, the, the burdens of incumbency, this, this new flexible, agile industry that is a star. So that's the first generation. The next generation that builds on these transistors, integrated circuits, microprocessors, the computer on the chip, that turn that, 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 that device from a piece of enterprise hardware, because look, what do the, the merchant semiconductor guys do? They're putting machines in other people's machines. Like, and if you, if you went to um, you know, the New York Times in the 70s and you're like trying to find a reference to Silicon Valley, you would not find it. It was kind of obscure off to the side. What kind of cements Silicon Valley in the public imagination is the emergence of two consumer-facing industries, video games and personal computers. But they are very, very much connected to the generations that come before it, including the Cold War spending that set the flywheel in motion. The kids who are the children of the people who come to Palo Alto in the 50s Yes, I'm just putting this up too, because aren't the first graders cute? Um, I don't know what these boys and girls grew up to be, but I have a pretty good guess that some of them were, by the late 60s, they were undergraduates at Berkeley and Stanford. They were children of the Cold War, shaped by, you know, th these were probably included children of not only Stanford professors, but Lockheed engineers. Steve Wozniak was the son of a, of a Lockheed engineer. Now, the, literally the children of the first generation. But they, and they are exposed to computers and computing courtesy of this incredible uh, outlay of money that is happening in the 50s and 60s that's going, among other places, to universities to create computer labs, creating these, where these, you have these mainframes and these mini computers housed in academic institutions that then are connected through time-sharing networks to terminals, like ones in high school math labs at Lakeside School in Seattle where Paul Allen and Bill Gates, I think he was a 10th grader in this picture, but he looks like he's about eight, um, are get hooked on computing, right? So the generation that builds the, 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 the consumer facing as well as enterprise facing, the kind of the next, you know, what we know as the, the, the modern personal computer and hardware and software industries are children of this you know, they, they get into computing because computers are in their part of their K through 12 and higher education process because of this spending. <laughs> but they get hooked on it and immediately are enraged by the fact that all the computers are pretty much in the possession of the man, right? The government, academia, universities big businesses. That's where all the mainframes were, that's where all the mini computers were, that's where all the computer power was. And so by the late 60s, these children of the post-war period, these baby boomers who were at Berkeley and at Stanford and other places, are going to the computer labs, they're getting, they're getting pulled into and fascinated by electronics and by the power that they see that being connected to a computer, what the possibilities are. And like this guy, Lee Felsenstein, who's here at Berkeley, he was, uh, he was, he was part of the anti-war movement at Berkeley. He was a shy guy and was not someone to stand 
on the barricades yelling, but he realized the people yelling had inadequate amplification, so he, he designed a, a megaphone for them, which I love. <laughs> so he's like, I'm gonna make you something, I'm gonna make you electronics, and here you go. So his contribution to the, to the anti-war effort was, was this. Um, but these kids like him are the ones who become this core tribe of 60s, to call them members of the counterculture sometimes doesn't quite capture their technological passions. But it's this community that becomes the core of what we, that, of this small community around, particularly around Stanford in the early 70s, that are talking about computers, power to the people. People like Stuart Brand, who is publishing the Whole Earth Catalog and featuring computers in it. <laughs> Um, tools for communication, tools for connection, tools for creativity. It's a very radically different idea of computing. This is the idea that animates the homebrew computer club and the where Lee Felsenstein is a founding member and where also two kids named Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs show up with their motherboard at meeting number two. And that's really where it all goes into hyperdrive. By the 70s, you have kids playing video games, not all made by Atari, <laughs> um, played by, uh, but, but Atari is a major player, um, so much so that by 1976, it's acquired by a major media company as a, or this is an important, but this is again, digital technology made personal and made consumer facing. But perhaps most importantly, you have uh, companies that are, uh, that are taking the ideals of the, pers the new emergent personal computer movement, which is about if everyone has one of these machines on their desk, and then we connect those machines to one another and we can communicate across for them, all of the inequities of the world, all of the things that are wrong are gonna fade away because we're gonna be on equal footing. The computer is a tool for creativity. There were a lot of little computer companies in around here in the late 70s that were trying to do to commercialize this technology. The one that really leapt ahead of the pack, of course, was Apple. And one of the reasons it did was because it became really good at explaining to people who were not crazy computer hobbyists about what a computer could do. So think about the other ads for the computers during this period. They're all about the specs. They're like, yeah, you got this much, this, that, that, this is what you can do. If you're not someone who understood computing, you would not understand it. But if you're reading the Wall Street Journal in August 1980 and you open up this full page ad and you see the header saying, when we invented the personal computer, which they did not, we created a new kind of bicycle. A bicycle for the mind. Makes you, you know, a human being can walk at a certain pace, but when they're on a bike, they can go faster. Same thing with a computer. That's a useful analogy. And you have a spokesman in Steve Jobs. But the people who are helping make this possible are not just Steve Jobs. It's venture capitalists like Don Valentine. It's Intel former Intel executives like Mike Markula, who comes into Apple early on and kind of turns it into a grown-up company. Marketing experts like Regis McKenna, who had been at Apple and other electronics industries. So part of Steve Jobs' genius is he surrounded himself with seasoned people from the industry. And that's where you see this connective tissue. Again, the generations of mentorship and experience, as well as money, are, connect, are, are picking the winners of the new generation. So by the time you get to the late 1980s, computers and the personal computer revolution and Silicon Valley itself are familiar ideas. And one of the things I trace in the book is how politicians of both parties kind of grabbed on to what was going on here and celebrated it as this example of the greatness of America, and particularly the greatness of American entrepreneurial capitalism. No one did this more eloquently, you'll not be surprised to, to know, than Ronald Reagan, who particularly, interestingly, really liked to talk about the Valley when he was talking to foreign audiences, like in Moscow in 1988. And this idea of these freewheeling cowboy entrepreneurs is something cemented in the dot-com era, encouraged and, and cemented in Washington's conscious, bipartisan consciousness in the 1990s by, under the administration of Bill Clinton and Al Gore, who were real champions of the valley, became, formed close ties with many people here, kind of won the valley over for the Democrats, because previously, generally, people had voted Republican, and it's the executives had you know, stayed away from the Democrats for as far as they could. 
and continues into this century when you have a new generation of young entrepreneurs who again, similar to Apple in the late 70s, a company like Facebook and also companies like Google take, identify young, talented, raw, raw talent and surround them with this net of expertise. Not only venture capital, but mentorship and, and marketing and public relations and legal advice, <laughs> crossing the T's, dotting the I's, creating this incredible support system to allow entrepreneurs to fly high. And politicians, too, form even closer connections with Silicon Valley and really advance the ideas of connecting people through software and hardware. The idea that if we close the digital divide, that the really messy political problems here at home will be overcome. By the time you get to the last 10, 15 years, everything goes into hyperdrive. It, the, so, the scope, the scale, the speed of change is remarkable. The computers that were on desks and then connected by the internet then shrink even further so it's in your pocket. And then when it goes mobile, that spawns an entirely new set of industries, set of companies, and set of questions and problems and disruptions that weren't anticipated by the people who were creating software. Software was no longer as simple kind of in a box. <laughs> it's no longer shrink wrapped. It's no longer contained. It's everywhere. And which creates incredible possibilities and incredible wealth, but also flows out in ways to, into political and, and social realms that, that technologists had really been not paying attention to at all. And so as we simultaneously went really, really small, what powers this incredible mobile technology, these supercomputers in our pockets, is the connection to the big, the, the connection to the cloud, the fact that now we've gone, you know, we, we, we spent 70 years shrinking the mainframe down, and now all that power goes, is now up in, in the cloud, in these giant servers far away, but now connected so we can have even more tiny technology, so we can even be more more mobile. And so where this book ends is not with a prediction, because I am a historian, I'm too, I know that people who make predictions are often wrong, but I think that history can give us a lot of insight in how we got to now, how we got, how these, how the biggest companies in tech became so big and why, and to really center the story of this area, this place in this, the mainstream of American history in the way that it hasn't been before. This is central. To understand the valley, you have to understand the, the nation that created it. And to understand the nation of the lab, the, Ameri the United States, the last 75 years, you also need to understand how tech has shaped it, how it has inspired, how is it, how is it intervened, how in ways both known and unknown it has reshaped the way that we communicate with one another. And so the big question is, is who's next? Is it going to be here or is it going to be somewhere else? Is it going to be which, what technology, what type, what set of companies? What's the next internet? Who's the next Mark Andreessen or Mark Zuckerberg? Who's the next Ann Hardy? Who's the next David Morgenthaler? Who's the next Fred Turman? Who are the next people who are going to seize opportunity and take advantage of it and, sh and bend the arc of history in their direction? So I look forward to talking to you, Greg, and talking to all of you.